One particular scripture, we've got a bunch of scriptures today. So uh, if you'd like to try to follow along, then uh, Luke 17 is the first place we're going we're gonna to land, and then we'll be all over the place, okay? Uh, as you know, last week we began a, a brand new series called um, Our Vision, Our Values, Our Victory. Our vision, our values, our victory. So this is not a typical, um, it's not a typical message series here. It does, it's not rooted necessarily in one particular scripture. We're uh, expounding on, on that. We, we're bringing some things together uh, to, to, sh to talk about who we are as a church, talk about who we, sh well, who we have to be, who we are, and how we do the things that God has called us to do. So last week we talked about, uh, and, and I hope you've seen this before, we talked about the vision of this church and Tanya's going to put that up, the vision of covenant life. Covenant life will go and make disciples. Now, that's not optional. Jesus said we had to. Okay, so every church, if you call yourself a church, then what you're supposed to be doing is going and making disciples. So that's the, that's the mission of our church, but the mission is encompassed in the vision. So how's Covenant Life going to do that? Because how we do that might be a little unique to us. So we're going to do that, make, go and make disciples by being real, relational, and reaching real relational and reaching i hope if you've attended church here for more than three times you've heard those words put together or you've seen it somewhere you've noticed that we say that we talk about that and i hope you've noticed we embody that real relational and reaching i believe that this is how we we win the harvest i believe this is how you disciple people and so we talked about that last week we talked about the vision of our church is to go and make disciples by being real relational and reaching now we also talked about the fact that there are values that accompany that vision. There is a way that we do ministry here that sets us apart probably from other churches. And so it's important for us to define that before you can make the decision as to whether or not you want to go all in at Covenant Life. You need to know who I am as a pastor. You need to know what kind of church this is before you can completely uh, commit yourself. And so if you're on the fence for that, uh, then, then this is your series. You heard Jordan mention in a couple weeks, we're going to have membership Sunday. I want you to hear the rest of the series before you decide. It's important. Church membership is important. I want you to know what you're getting into because not all, to, not all churches are the same. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. All right. So there, there is God call, I believe God calls particular people to particular places for a reason, and you need to make sure this is where God's calling you. Now, there are some of you who have been attending here for a long time and have never joined the church, and I hope you can consider, you will consider joining the church. It, 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 I'm not going to revoke your, you know, your parking privileges or anything. I, I just want you to consider doing that if you've been attending for a while, or maybe you're a you're a member and you've been here for a long time, and you just like you, you, you know sometimes when you get married you renew your vows. Maybe you just want to say, Pastor, I just want to kind of renew my members, my commitment to membership, and you just put that on the connection card, and we'll we'll do that. So uh, I just want to encourage everybody to consider the place they're supposed to serve. You need to know where you're serving. So last week we talked about real. We talked, what are the values that, that, that sort of explain how we're going to be real in our community? Well, we talked about if we're going to be real, we have to have a real faith. And so the first of the values we talked about last week is the why is as important as the what. The why is as important as the what. Religion happens when you undertake what you don't understand. There are too many people that, that do things in the name of Jesus. They have no idea what they're doing or why they're doing it. They do it out of religious ritual. They do it out of habit. They do it because everybody else is doing it. But they don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. We believe it's important for us to do, to, to do what we do with understanding behind it. We want there to be a relationship with the Word of God, a relationship with, with the God of the Word, and a relationship with each other so that we know that our faith is real. It's built on something. Not on habit, not on ritual, not on tradition. It's built on, 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 a real, on a real foundation that helps us understand why we're doing it. Because when the going gets tough, if you don't know why you're doing it, it's really easy to stop. So it's important for us to know why we do what we do. The second thing, if we're going to be real, we have to be real honest. So part of the way we are real honest around here is saying this, life's tough. Uh, they're not all not every church you can go into and admit that you're having a hard time It's not every church you can go into and admit that you're having a bad day It's not every church you can go into and admit that maybe you're that you're struggling with a particular sin a particular habit With a particular weakness in your life. It is okay for everything not to be awesome in your life all the time 
we, we lie all the time in church, don't we? How are things going? Oh, it's awesome. It's just awesome. God's just blessing, and we're just making junk up all the time. So we've got to be honest. We've got to be, we've got to be willing to be honest. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have trials. You'll have tribulation. However, he didn't stop there. He said, but cheer up. Be of good cheer. Be encouraged because I've overcome the world. So yes, life's tough, but we also believe laughing helps. We believe laughing helps. Sometimes you face things, you're either going to have to laugh or cry. We just decided we'd, just, we'd rather laugh. Amen. We'd just rather laugh. So well, we're just we're a bunch of lunatics around here. Well, not all of us, but most of us are lunatics around here. So we just, we just like to laugh our way through life if we can. Not inappropriately so, not making fun of people. You know, but but you, when you come to those moments where you just, you just have to laugh or cry, we just rather laugh. And we'd rather laugh with each other. So we, we aggravate each other and we speak you know, sarcasm fluently around here. And we, uh, just saying that sounded sarcastic, didn't it? And it? So anyway, we like to laugh and we believe, that's, we believe it's biblical and we believe it's important. And then the last thing, how are we going to be real in our, uh, in our community, going and making disciples? We're going to have a real faith. We have to, have, uh, we have to be real honest. And, and then the last thing is this, we have, to, we have to make sure that we understand there is no substitute for the presence and power of God in our lives or in our services. There, there's, you just can't, I cannot pastor a church where God is not, where the Holy Spirit is not willing, is not allowed to move. The Holy Spirit's always willing where he's not allowed to move. Even among Pentecostal churches, there's this trend away from what we've known to be the presence and the power of God moving in our services. I, I, I have searched the scripture. I've done the research. I, I have searched my heart. And I have prayed and fasted and, and asked God what to do. And I, I know that I cannot pastor a church where the presence and the power of God is not allowed to move. I believe most of you are here for that same reason. And so uh, what, what I want us to understand and I want everybody to know very clearly is there is no substitute. You cannot plan enough. You can't be creative enough. You can't spend enough money on lights and fog and sound and, and all of that kind of stuff. It doesn't matter. When you bring somebody into, the, into a church, when, when there's somebody in your family that's got a need, you, you don't care how good the coffee is. You don't care how cool the lobby looks. You don't care how, how fantastic the singers are or the musicians or how good looking the pastor is. Help us, Lord. You, what you need Need is the presence and the power of God to change that person's life and to change your life. There's no substitute for that. And we believe there's no division between the sacred and the secular. The stuff we do in here is sacred, but it doesn't stop when we walk out the door. What you do on Monday afternoon is sacred. What you do on Thursday morning is sacred. What you do on Saturday night, I hope, is sacred. Everything about us, if we call ourselves children of God, then everything we do reflects the glory of God. Everything that we do should, should recognize the presence and the power of God. So that was last week. If you, didn't, if you weren't here, we had a, technical, a technological t catastrophe last week. Uh, it, was, it was even harder than it was to say. Um, the audio recording didn't work. The video audio didn't work either. So there was no recording of that. So there's your summary of last week. Today we're going to talk about what... what uh, Jenny referenced what Jordan referenced, and that's being relational, being relational. So I want to I want to answer this question today: How important are people to fulfilling the mission of God? How important are people to fulfilling the vision and, and the values, honoring those values in our church? I mean, if you want to be a good church, a pleasing church, don't you just have to preach good and sing good, and every once in a while give some food away to people? I mean, isn't that what the isn't that how you be a good church? Well, we're going to sort of dive in and we're going to see what God has to say about that. Uh, a gentleman named J James Strakehand said this, Saving knowledge is diffused over the earth, not like sunlight, but like torchlight. It is passed from person to person. Saving knowledge is diffused over the earth, not like sunlight everywhere all the time, but like torchlight, it passes from one person's hand to another person's hand to another person's hand. You say, John, what, is it, what, what does the word say in the scriptures about it, though? 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul told Timothy, the stuff that you've learned from me, 
I am entrusting to you and you find faithful people and you teach them and then they will in turn take what you teach them and teach it to others. That is the pattern of discipleship. It's the pattern of, of evangelism. You take what you know from God and you tell it to somebody else and then that person tells it to somebody else and that person tells it to somebody else. Passing the torch from person to person. Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses told the children of Israel, he said, here's how we're going to pass down the law. You, you parents, you teach it to your children. You teach it when you get up, when you go to sleep. You teach it at the dinner table. You teach it when you're walking down the road. You teach it coming and going. Every time you get a chance, you teach the principles of the kingdom of God in everyday activities and everyday conversations. You pass it from person to person. The New Testament version of that in Acts chapter 2, after the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached a message, and after the response to the message, in verses 42 through 47, it outlines the activities of the early church. And key to that is that they had these fellowship dinners. It, it, after they went to synagogue, after, after they went to the temple, and they had their meetings in the temple, they'd go to each other's houses. It was the equivalent of going to Burger King and going to Captain D's and Cracker Barrel after church. They went and they fellowshiped and they ate together. Now, sometimes it wasn't always a Bible study. If you put believers together or across a table from each other with good food in the middle, there's going to be something spiritual said. There's going to be something spiritual happen. Y'all ever been to a table with Christian people? Y'all act like, you're like well, I don't know about all that. There is no discipleship without fellowship. And so if you just get together, I promise you, these ladies get together and they start doing you know, craftiness, the craftiness happens, there's going to be some discipleship going on. Because one woman's going to say to another one, you know, I'm having a hard time. You know, my husband crazy. <laughs> yeah, that happens all the time. You know, and my husband, I don't know what to do with, and, and there's going to be this discipleship happening. When you have relationships, that's the foundation for discipleship. It's important that the apostles knew it. And that's why they, they set it up that way. Now, let me show you in Luke chapter 17. If you opened your Bibles, that's where you rested. If you don't, didn't bring your Bible, it's right here in front of you. Luke chapter 17, verses 21, 22. When the Pharisees had demanded of him, him is Jesus, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God comes not with outward show. Okay, it's not something that happens on the outside. Neither shall they say, lo, it's here, or lo, it's there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. Jesus said, if you're looking for the kingdom, it's not an outward kingdom. It's in the hearts of men and women. It's in people. Amen. Now I want to, uh, John 3, 16. I want to show you this. Maybe the most famous passage of scripture in the Bible. For God loved the world so much, he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Understand, God didn't love the earth. He loved the world. That means the people on the earth. You recognize that? You understand that? It's not that, G that God is in love with the earth. It's not that he's in love with our geology and our geography. He's in love with the people on this earth. And he loved them so much that he gave every individual the chance to come and know him and to experience eternal life. And then in Mark chapter 16, which is a restatement of the Great Commission that, that, that is the foundation of our mission and our vision, Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. But look what he said, to every creature. He didn't say to every language. He didn't say to every people group. He didn't say to every nation. He said to every creature. Each individual person is important to God. Everybody you encounter every day at the grocery store, at work, on the ball field, everywhere you go, every individual you encounter is important to God. Amen. So the Great Commission, let, let's put this together. The Great Commission is carried out by people and for people. Jesus died for people, and he lives in people and, and, and through people. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is in people and works through people. So I'd say we're not in the singing business. We're not in the preaching business. We're not in the teaching business. We're not in the offering business. We're not in the social services business. The church of Jesus Christ is in the people business. And so the only way to fulfill our vision and, and to honor our values and to see the victory yeah, on this earth and in the life to come is if we are relational. We have to be relational. And that means people. 
See, relationally minded people, they just see the world differently. It just looks different when you, when you look at the world relationally. And a relationally minded church does as well. A relationally minded church just sees things differently. And so I, let's kind of dive into this, this week's value. So here's the first thing. Religion, r- relational people see activity as a means to an end. Activity as a means to an end. It's not about the thing, but there's a reason we do the thing. So here's the first value. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Can I get an amen on that? Love is shown by going the extra mile. Love is shown by going the extra mile. So let's look at that in the Word. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23. This is what, this is what Paul told the Colossians. Can I see Colossians 3? There it is. Work willingly at whatever you do. Oh, that hurts. Work willingly at whatever you do. As though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. It's not about that thing, you whatever that thing is, whatever widget you make for a living, whatever service you provide, whatever it is you do, it's not about that thing that you do. It's about the one you serve. It's the, the, the thing you do is a means to an end. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, he said, if a soldier demands you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Carry it an extra mile. That's where that term comes from. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. That's the next verse, verse 42. Do you you see the pattern that's developing here? See, someone said love is in the details. Love's in the details. That's why people also say it's the thought that counts. It's the thought that counts. Taking the time to think about somebody, taking the time to think about something, to process through something, taking the time to do something special for somebody, taking the time to give an extra effort for somebody, taking the time to do something when it's not required, that's how you demonstrate your love for somebody. That's how they know they're being loved. And guess what? It doesn't even have to be a person you like. Hallelujah. Please don't raise your hand, but would you admit that there might be some people on this earth that you just don't like? I told y'all not to respond, but thank you for making me feel better. There, there are just, there's just people you just don't get along with, right? And there are some people that just make it hard to like, right? Well, now that you've already said it, you can say amen now. So there are just people that are hard to like and they do that to themselves, but it doesn't mean we get off the hook for loving them. We have to love people. So we can demonstrate our love. We can go the extra mile for a person that we don't even like. I promise you the Jewish people that Jesus was talking to didn't care nothing about those Roman soldiers. And he said if one of them asked you to carry his gear for a mile, which is bad enough, just carry it too. Just throw in an extra mile for free. Not because you like him, but because you love him because God says to. You love him because God loved you when you were unlovable, when you were hard to love. Anybody admit that you might have been hard to love a time or two in your life? See, relational people see every activity as a means to an end. It's not about doing the task. It's about using the task to communicate value and worth to that person and ultimately using that task to be able to demonstrate how much Jesus loves that person. It's not about the thing that we do. So see, for me, this is where excellence comes in. It's not excellence for excellence's sake. That's why one of the values that we have is not we're going to be excellent. It's not about the excellence. It's about why we're being excellent. For me, it's about serving people. Excellence happens when you, when you value the people that, that you're working with, the value the people that you're leading. You see, I, I recognize when I stand in this platform, uh, in this pulpit, this imaginary pulpit, that... I need to be ready. And I get ready not only to honor God, I get ready to help you understand that I value you and I value your time. And I appreciate the fact that you got up on a Sunday morning and took a bath. Thank you, by the way. I understand that some of you ladies spent some time putting on makeup. Thank you, by the way. You guys put on deodorant and everything. And I appreciate that. 
And I recognize that there's a bunch of things that you could be doing on Sunday mornings, and yet you come week after week. I, I respect that. I value that. And so I spend a lot of time making sure that when you show up, I'm ready for you. And I hope when you go home every week, you're like, yeah, it wasn't the best thing I've ever heard. Didn't change my life or nothing, but I can tell he tried. <laughs> Gave the whole college a try. Because I value you, I try to be excellent to the extent that I can. It's the same thing with Jeff and Bree, these guys, down to two instruments and three singers. And we worshiped the Lord today, didn't we? It's, it, it was excellence. Now, was it the most awesome? We're going to be on the radio next week? Probably not. But it served the purpose because we offer God everything we had. Amen. Amen. Excellence. And that's what excellence is for. It's not in the things that you do. It's from why you do them. Not, not being, if you show up not being prepared, for me, that's disrespectful to the people who are there. If you show up late when you told somebody you were going to be there, that's disrespectful to them. You, you, if, you, if you just don't show up, you commit to doing something, you just don't show up. It's disrespectful. To people who have who have to rearrange their lives to accommodate you. Uh, uh, last year, we were able to go up to the Kelly Foundation and do some uh, and just do some ministry and some activities with the residents there. It's a it's a senior center. It's a um, uh, assisted living facility up there. And so we went up and we did the first deal. And, and, and afterwards, they told Pastor Robbie, they said, "You you can come anytime you want to. You just let us know what you want to do and when, and we'll make it happen." And he was like, wow, we appreciate you, you know, swinging the doors. you got a lot of churches that come up and do that. She said, this is why we're allowing you to do it. You're the first church that showed up. She said, she or he, I don't remember who he was talking to, but said, this person said, we've been contacted by many churches that say they're coming. And so we get the residents together and we bring them in here. We wheel everybody in, help them in, sit them down, and they don't ever come. You showed up. So you get to do anything you want to do. I mean, in, in some ways, that's, that's encouraging for us that, that there's a difference. It, it is really discouraging to me that we have set the bar so low in the body of Christ that if you just show up, you're better than 80% of the people. That is ridiculous. We've lost the purpose. We've lost the why. And the why is people. The why is people. This is not just where excellence comes in. This is where sacrificial living comes in. Every task you do has a people purpose. Everything you do has a people purpose. It's always about people. So you want to do the best you can do every time. You want to go over and above. You want to sacrifice because it's about people. Hey, relational people, you will never hear a relational person say, that's not my job. That's not my job. If every task has a, people uh, has a people purpose, then every task is your way of reaching somebody, regardless of what your job description is. So if you're assigned a task that's not necessarily delineated in your job description, then you can approach it eagerly, knowing you're not working for the, for, for the man, you're not working for the boss, you're working for the Lord, and every task is an opportunity for you to engage somebody and demonstrate the love of Jesus for them and how you do what you do. Every task has a people purpose, purpose, and if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Here's the second thing. How are we going to be relational in, in this community? The second thing is this. See, relational people see every encounter as an opportunity. Now, we're, not, we're moving just, not just from what we do. Every encounter we have with a person is an opportunity for the kingdom of God. So here's, here's the second thing, and this is uh, maybe profound in its simplicity. How you treat people matters. We believe that here. We believe how you treat people matters. Love is the language of God. He is love. So if you're, if you're loving people, love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. And he that doesn't love doesn't know God. For God is love. That's 1 John 4, 7, and 8. How you treat people matters. Let me show you this in a startling way. John chapter 13, this is what Jesus said. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Look, when the Son of God shows up on the earth and says, I'm giving you a new commandment, I mean, the first 10, were, they worked pretty well for several thousand years. So if he shows up and says, I'm giving you a new commandment, we should probably pay attention. He said this, love each other. 
Like, for real, is that that's all you got, Jesus? Love each other? Love each other. He says in another place, if you love God and love each other, that takes care of all the other commandments. So he said, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Now, this, this will blow your mind if you recognize what he's saying. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. The litmus test, follow me here, the litmus test for whether or not we are followers of Jesus is not how many miracles we perform. It's not how awesome we are at performing our duties. It's not how perfect we are. It's not never making mistakes. Jesus said our biggest and most obvious connection to the divine is in how we love people. Amen. That is so simple. It's so simple to understand. It's so difficult to do sometimes. But how you treat people matters. Paul said in Ephesians 5 that, that marriage was given as an example to the world for how Christ loved the church and how the church loved Christ. Our marriages are supposed to be examples. How we treat each other, how husbands and wives treat each other is supposed to be an example to the world of how Jesus loves the church. Lord, help us. 1 Peter says, how we, how husbands, how you treat your wives affects your prayer life. Paul and Peter both said, how you treat your boss affects your witness to that boss. Amen. According to Ephesians, students, those of you who are still living at home, according to Ephesians, obeying your parents is a matter of interest to God. He cares about whether you do what your parents tell you to do or not. How you treat your parents matters to God, students. Not just to your parents. How you treat people matters. Now here's the other mind-blowing thing in Romans chapter 8. It's a little, a little lengthy. Stay with me here. About eight or nine verses. Y'all still got that focus? Everybody okay? <laughs> what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? So he's about to, to talk about a power that is unstoppable. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us, won't he also give us everything else? Those of you who are living in fear, that's the verse you stand on. He's going to give you everything you need. So quit thinking you have to do everything yourself. Sidecar, you know, just keep that, that's free. Verse 33, who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he's sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. For those of you, this, this didn't happen in first service. For those of you who think you're nothing, those of you who think that your life amounts to nothing, that nobody notices whether you live or die, everything Jesus did was for you. Which means the Father values your, your life more than the Son's. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us, uh, loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? If you listen to the prosperity teachers, they'll tell you that that's exactly what that means. I just said that out loud, so sorry about that if it's offensive. The circumstances of your life do, are not a manifestation of God's love for you or his attention to you. Just because you feel afraid, just because you feel like you've been abandoned does not mean God has ignored you and doesn't know where you are. It gets worse if that just messed with your theology. As scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We're being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. How do you figure? Well, verse 38, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. So can we stop right there and say that God's love is, is bigger than your circumstances? It's bigger than your bank account. It's bigger than your health. It's bigger than your relationships. It's bigger than your stage and lot in life. 
that even if you feel like you've been dealt a raw deal, a bad hand, that God's love is bigger than that and nothing that you will ever experience can separate you from that love. So don't get worked up in the circumstances of your life. It is not an indication of how much God loves you. Amen. I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor uh, nor neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that's revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me ask you this question. If love, the love of God is so powerful, more powerful than demons, more powerful than persecution, more powerful than poverty, more powerful than your past and anything else that you ever have or ever will encounter, if that love is so powerful and if God has shed his love abroad in our hearts, then should we not learn to share that with the world? We try to share our holiness. We try to share our opinions. We try to share our politics. We try to share everything else. But if we're going to speak to the world and if we're going to go and make disciples, we got to talk to them. If we're going to speak to the world, the language they'll understand is love. Remember, the vision is to go and make disciples out of people who don't believe. When you look at the Gospels, sinners love Jesus. They came to him, and he loved them back. It was, the, it was the religious people that he spoke harshly to. It's the religious people that hated him. It's the religious people that crucified him. So, well, I don't know about all that, Pastor, and we, we, we can't be hanging out with those people. They'll rub off on us, and, you know, we, just, we can't do all that. We've got to stand strong. We've got to tell them, look, I'm not saying you water down the message. That's not the point. Jesus was just as honest with the, saint, with the sinners as he was with the saints. And we're not watering down the message. Everybody okay? You still with me? It's not about watering down the message. It's about speaking the truth in love. You realize that you can say the same thing two different ways and get two different results. You do realize that. If you don't realize that, husbands, that's why you have marriage problems. Um, it's not just about what you say it's how you say it and why you say it and the why is as important as the what and if you speak the truth without love or if you love people without speaking the truth you're misrepresenting the gospel of Jesus and the character of God that was a lot I didn't breathe much there let me say that again if you speak the truth without love or if you love people without speaking the truth to them You're misrepresenting the character of God. We don't water down the message. We just make sure that we are motivated to preach that message out of love for the people and not just love for the truth. I want to show you James chapter 2 and verse 1. If you dislike me now, you will hate me in just a moment. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Can I tell you that partiality is not of God? That prejudice is not of God? It doesn't matter to God what race they are. It doesn't matter to God how much money they have. It doesn't matter to God how well connected they are in this world. It doesn't matter to God what sins they've committed or how many they've committed. And if it matters to you but it doesn't matter to God, then you need to repent and get yourself aligned with the word and the character of God. Because John said this, as if James wasn't honest and bold enough, John said this, if you say you love God but you hate your brother, then you are a liar and the truth is not in you. So we got to check our hearts and we got to make sure that we're not showing partiality to one person over another person or one demographic over another demographic. How you treat people matters. No matter what they look like or where they come from, how you treat people matters. Last week I used the model of Chick-fil-A to, to, talk, to sort of intro this series. Why is it that people are so impressed with the faith of the owners and operators of Chick-fil-A? Well, I'll tell you because we're running out of time. Because how they treat people matches what they say they believe. 
How they treat people matches what they say they believe. There are a lot of people that don't believe what Chick-fil-A says they believe, but they believe that they believe it, right? They don't call them hypocrites. They may criticize what they believe, but nobody's saying they're not living out what they claim to believe because the way they run their business is a good reflection of their faith. They treat people with great respect. They're, they're, they're more polite than they have to be. They bring people their food. Do you realize what would happen at McDonald's if someone left behind the counter to bring you a hamburger? I mean, the world would shut down and reverse the spin on its axis. I mean, something catastrophic would happen. It's just different. The food, the food is hot. It, you, they get you in and out in a hurry. You know, they close on Sundays, not just to honor God, but to honor their employees and give them a chance to worship and to, and to have some time with their family. They treat their employees right. Let me ask you this. How well respected would they be if their belief that the, what they claimed to believe was the same, but they didn't say, my pleasure, every time they saw you? If they didn't bring you their food, your food, if they were just as slow as everybody else, if, if their food was lukewarm when you showed up or, or cold, like my hamburger was this week, if their employees seemed like they were mad at everybody about everything, they weren't treating their employees well. Would the connection to their faith be as clear? How you treat people matters. Think about this as a church. Think about this as a church. Will people believe that our faith is real if we don't treat people well? Look, today when you leave church and you go out to eat, ask the server. You can do an informal survey. I've, I've done it. Ask the servers about working on Sunday. They'll, if they're honest with you, they're probably working you for a tip. But if they're honest with you, they're going to tell you, I hate working on Sundays, Amen. especially Sunday afternoon, especially the church crowd. I hate working the church crowd. Amen. Well, why is that? Because they don't tip. They're rude. They complain about everything. They send their food back all the time. They will tell you they'll work six days a week as long as they don't have to work on Sunday afternoon because the church crowd drives everybody crazy. I, I went to a conference in Ohio. There was a very famous church in the area. The person I was talking to used to work for that church and attended their, their worldwide conferences. And the pastor of the church would have to get up in the pulpit and say, you are representing us while you're here. Please tip. Please quit leaving a mess at the restaurants. The restaurants are calling us to complain about the, the people who are attending our conference here. You're killing us. You're killing our witness in our town. Stop it. <laughs> or at least quit telling people why you're here. Right? If you're going to act a fool, at least don't do it in Jesus' name. <laughs> That's why some of y'all should not put a fish on your car. I have watched y'all drive. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Drive crazy in Jesus' name. How... <laughs> How we treat people at church. I need sleep or something. I'm just a lot funnier to me than I am to anybody else today. How we treat people matters at church. I, I, I do the research. I read the articles. And I've, and I've done it even among our own church. You have unchurched people or first timers show up in church and maybe they finally pull themselves together and say, I'm going to church. I, I've got to have something. Something's got to change in my life. And they finally decide to go to church and they've never been there in their, in their lives. And they wander on up in here and they stumble in the door. How are they going to know where the bathrooms are? How are they going to know where the sanctuary or even what a sanctuary is? How are they going to know where the kids are supposed to go? How are they even supposed to know there's a nursery where you can like park your kid for an hour? Yes. How are they supposed to know all that if they've never been to church? And how many of us walk past them on our way to do whatever it was we were doing and we never even look at them? We never acknowledge how confused. They're dazed and confused. They've never been here. We've got to be intentional and relational. We've got to pay attention to the people around us. It's not going to hurt anything to, for you to stop and say, can I help you find somebody? Do you know where you're going? Is this your first time here? It's nobody's job to do it. Amen. It's everybody's job Amen. to do it. What we, have, what we do know from the research is that it makes people ill when the only people that speak to them are the ones who have the name tags or the people that's their job. They want, if they want to know how the people are, and it takes all of us being intentional, we've got to be different. 
So why do we care? We're trying to grow a church here. Pastor, I thought it was about growing the kingdom. Well, the kingdom can't grow if there ain't nobody coming. Pardon, pardon my grammar. But if you offend them to the point they don't want to come back, how are they going to hear the gospel? How are they going to experience the presence and the power of God? Here's the last point. I know you're happy. Relational people see what could be instead of what has been. Relational people see what could be instead of what has been. So here's the value that we're, that, that the third value in relational. We're more concerned about where you're going than where you've been. We're more concerned about where you're going than where you've been. Jesus makes your past a stepping stone, not a stumbling block. Let's look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. So there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. No condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Our job is not condemnation. Not for sinners and not for saints. You say, well, John, that's clearly talking about those who are in Christ Jesus, so there's no condemnation for them. Well, hey, you know what? Conviction's not our job either. Convicting sinners of sin is not our job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. So our job's to love people. Other people are in the condemnation business. His name is Satan. Other people are in the conviction business. His name is the Holy Spirit. Our job, Jesus said, is to love people. If we fulfill out, this may be a news flash, so I want to make sure everybody understands. If we fulfill our vision, there will be people in here who don't look like us and don't act like us, may not smell like us, don't behave like us. There'll be people that are all pierced and tatted up and got crazy hair or even have hair. There'll be, there'll be gay and transgender jeans here, uh, teens here, jeans, sorry, teens here, wearing strange jeans. How about that? That's where I was going with that. There'll be adulterous businessmen here. There'll be ladies here with addiction problems. There'll be people here living in all kinds of sin. There'll be people caught up in the occult. You say, well, Pastor, I don't know if I want those kinds of people in our church. Well, what kind of sinners are we comfortable with? What kind of sinners are you okay with? Is it, is it like the bad sinners or is it like the kind of sin that you were involved in when you, before you knew Jesus? Where, where are the bad sinners supposed to go? If we're okay with the good sinners, where do the bad sinners go to find Jesus? But what about your kids and grandkids? They all act like they all doing what they're supposed to be doing. They acting crazy like everybody else's kids and grandkids. Where are they supposed to go? What happens if church they don't let your grandkids in? Who's gonna go? Everything that we've done up to this point in our lives is either going to be a stepping stone or a stumbling block. And how we disciple people is going to make the difference. There, there are places that if you've ever sinned at all, then you're, they're going to remind you of that every chance you get. You treat them like second class citizens because they weren't born in the church, cut their teeth on the pews. We can make it a stumbling block or, or we can put our arms around somebody and we can speak life into them and we can say, we're glad you're here. We can put our arms around somebody that don't know if they're a boy or a girl and say, we're glad you're here. And give them a little space. If they don't run to the altar the first time they show up, don't complain to me and ask me to ban them from the church. Give God a little time to work. He's been taking his time with me. Taking his time with you. We need to give folks a little space. <laughs> Valerie, I hope you're coming next week. It may just be us. <sighs> We've got to, we, we can't make every, we can't make a person's past a stumbling block. We've got to make it a stepping stone. Put our arms around them and say, I know you're confused now, but when you come to Jesus, he, will, he washes you clean. He makes you holy. He gives you the power to shake loose from all this stuff in your life. And you, you help them to step up on that thing that they've been through, not fall over it. And here's the last scripture, and I'm going to close. And you're happy. Acts chapter something, nine. When Saul eventually became Paul, arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. 
And, and you, you know, rightfully so, because he was killing Christians. So, you know, we're not going to get on our religious soapboxes about that. We wouldn't have let him in either, probably. We put Blaine back there with a gun. It's, no, you ain't coming in here. Um, they did not truly believe that he had become a believer. So Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the way, the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. And so Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> we need to be a Barnabas people. Barnabas means a son of encouragement. Barnabas was the one who was willing to take a chance on Paul. The world would be a lot better off if we had more Barnabases, Barnabai. If we had more than one Barnabas in the world. As a matter of fact, there might be more Pauls if we had more Barnabases. If we had more people who were willing to come alongside and, and put their arm around somebody and say, tell me about your walk with the Lord. Tell me what you're experiencing. And then take a chance on somebody. Put their arm around them and believe in them. Encourage them. Vouch for them. Lend them a little bit of credibility. Give them some opportunities. I, I, look, if you'll set aside predestination and God's plans for everybody, set that aside for just a second and just imagine with me what happens if Saul shows up and they don't let him in the church. What happens if there's no Barnabas there that day to say, hey, I, I'm, I'm believing this brother right here. He's going to be okay. If, if he, he's with me. What happens if there's no Barnabas for Saul? We lost half the New Testament. Tens of thousands of people in his lifetime and millions since then don't know Christ because we didn't let him in and we didn't wrap our arms around him and encourage him and give him opportunities to go with the apostles and watch them do ministry. It's important. How you treat people matters. And we've got to be more concerned about where a person's going than where a person's been. If we filtered our attendance for those with perfect pasts, there'd be no pastor and no congregation. And we can't draw the line right behind whatever it was we did. We can't use our little spiritual crayon. Bree, please come and play some. some. I'm on a roll. We can't use our little spiritual crayon and draw the lines all around everybody but us. So we asked, we asked a question. How vital are people to the vision? How vital are people to the values? How vital are people to doing what Christ called us to do and going and making disciples? They are the reason we do what we do. If we're not relational, we're, we cannot, we cannot fulfill the mission of the church. We can't. So we've got to be intentional about relationships. Why don't you stand with me today? We've got to be intentional about relationships. We're going to pray. I'm going to ask them to sing. and I'm just going to give you a, a verse and a chorus or so to just let the Lord do what he's going to do in your life, and then we'll be dismissed together. But during this time, I want you to think about what God's saying to you. Think about where you are in your relationships with people, how you treat people, if you're a business owner, how you treat your employees. You go, to a sec you go to a job somewhere, how do you treat your coworkers? How do you treat your customers? How do you treat your bosses? How we treat people matters. How we treat people in this church matters. So I just want you to think about all of those relationships and all of those opportunities that God places in front of us every day. Do we see them? Or are we so busy doing our things that we forget why we're doing them? Let's pray and then they're going to sing. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do what only he can do. Lead us and guide us to truth, even the truth about ourselves. Search us, know us, reveal to us who we are. In Jesus' name, amen.